This passage from Philippians, the second reading today, is one of the most famous, justly so, in our tradition. It, scripture scholars point out that it seems to be uh, an early Christian hymn, uh, which Paul adapted uh, for the letter that he wrote here. So Paul didn't make it up, it was already currency, current. Um, and, you know, nowadays it's sometimes uh, stylish uh, uh, to uh, downplay Christianity and say, oh, you know, Jesus only became God in the fourth century with Constantine and the Council of Nicaea, which did clarify it. But obviously, if you look at this from the very middle of the first century, soon after, well, it's pretty soon after Jesus' resurrection, they're already speaking of Jesus being in the form of God. So let's look a little bit at this because it's so eloquent and so telling, so revealing, not only about Jesus, but what our path should be following Jesus. As it says, have this mind in you which is also in Christ Jesus, or another translation, have this mind in you which you have in Christ Jesus. So it's clearly something for us as well. We, we don't start out in the form of God, but that's what it says. He's in the form of God, but did not consider equality with God harpagman in Greek, which means something you've robbed, something you, you snatch and cling to, you know, like a robber and his booty, you know. Uh, so that's not how Jesus regarded being God. I've got to cling to this. It's, it's my right, you know. I'm, uh, that wouldn't be God at least not the God that's revealed in Jesus. So he, and this is, as many have pointed out even in our own day, this is the central truth and concept of Christianity theologically and spiritually. He emptied himself. Ekonosin in Greek. The word just means empty. So he emptied himself. What, what, what can that mean for God? Well, it means that we obviously gave up clinging to the rights of being God or the status of being God and emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. It's pretty strong language. He didn't just become human, although it goes on to say that. But for that, reality is to be a slave. Taking the form of a slave and appearing in human likeness, it says, he humbled himself even further to become obedient unto death and even death on a cross. So how should we understand this emptying? Obviously he was still God's. So he didn't empty himself of, well, what, what, what does it mean? I suggest what it really means is that he revealed God he revealed by emptying himself, that is by pouring himself out, pouring his love into the world, pouring his life out into the, for the incarnation and into the world. So it was the outpouring of divine love, divine life, that God is, and that's the source of the Trinity as well. It's simply an outpouring of the Father to the Son, an outpouring of the Son to the Father, into the world, in the Spirit, that that's God's life. God's life is a self-emptying, Father to Son, already in the Trinity itself, as revealed in Christ. But so it's a pouring out of love. That's how it's an emptying. It's not holding on to anything for yourself, like something to be robbed or clung, clung to. It's a pouring out, a complete pouring yourself out in love, emptying yourself of yourself, and any, any self-reference and simply sharing divine life. So that's what he did. That's what he did in the, in the creation already. All things were created through him, pouring himself out into the creation to share divine life and love with creation. And then pouring it out even more to be in union with us. And even more, pouring himself so far out that he wanted to become one of us. Not just pouring out love into creation, but be pouring out love to become creation, to become human, to become 
creaturely in that human nature. Mm -hmm. So the outpouring is love, a total giving. That's God's own life. And that's Christ's life as a man. And that should be our life, therefore, made in the image of God and to share the divine life. So here he is, he became one of us, sharing our life, giving his own life to us. And then what? Well, he revealed who God was by his teaching and by his actions in the world, did he not? A complete pouring out. It was going around healing and saving, and going to the tax collectors and prostitutes. His, God, his ways are not our ways, clearly, as the first reading proclaims. We can't understand God's ways until we see it in Christ, and it doesn't make any sense to us. Going to the least worthy, but that's how you reveal love, is it not? Completely pouring yourself out, not measuring, not calculating who's worthy and who's not. Emptying himself. So what does that mean if you reveal yourself as absolute love in this world? You get killed. Because the powers that be don't like that kind of total effusion of love, the indiscriminate liberation of people. Religious power and political power hates that. They want to be in control. So the chief priests and the scribes, who, as the gospel makes clear, said they were going to follow God and then didn't, as often religious people don't. Religion is just a way of, well, clinging and robbing and feeling superior. You know, the Pharisaic, the Pharisee uh, you know, syndrome, which is, you know, eternal, you know, always showing up. Mm -hmm. So that kind of using religion for your own ends, your own robbery, your own power, your own image, self-image and social advancement, um, they don't like that. So they kill the real prophet who comes along. But Jesus showed his, not just humility, but his love by emptying himself still further and submitting to that. Not returning evil for evil, but in the midst of that suffering, trusting in his Father, forgiving his crucifiers and persecutors, thus revealing how far God was emptying himself and how far love empties itself, not calculating, even to death on a cross, obedient to death on a cross. And therefore, it says, therefore God exalted him and gave him the name above every name. Why is that? Well, it wasn't like, okay, now he went through all that, so he gets a nice reward, we'll give him uh, the name above every name. No, it was an organic flow. God's love revealed in creation, incarnation, God's love revealed in the passion, and now God's love revealed in the resurrection. Because he was so the perfect revelation of God's love through all of that, that love is continues through the fullness of life and love as he returns in his humanity to the Father. That love reaches its culmination, reaches its perfection, reaches its fullness in his humanity. It's perfectly logical. The resurrection is the totally logical conclusion, organic conclusion of the incarnation and then the passion through that. So the whole story, the whole Paschal mystery, is a revelation of God's emptying himself and showing that that's what life is. Eternal life, divine life, human life. It's an emptying of ourselves in perfect love. So as I say, religion is not for, you know, feeling good about yourself and getting one up on somebody else and feeling superior. Again, the gospel makes that clear. Those people say, I'm serving God, and then they don't. Whereas the poor sinners, tax collectors and the prostitutes, realize the total abundance of this undeserved love of God, and they live it. They say, they see, appear to say no, but then they say yes. So that's what it should mean for us. Total outpouring of love, no calculation of worthiness or unworthiness, 
simple gift of oneself to share in the divine life, which, by the way, is what heaven is. So if you want to go there, you might as well get started. And I would say that the first part of the second reading today that introduces the hymn gives us a great indication of just how this should work. And for our, for our own time, right here and now, in the U.S. today, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any, any consolation in love, any participation in the Spirit, literally koinonia, literally fellowship in the Spirit, so we have this sense of being together and being consoled by God's love and encouraged by God's love. If there's any compassion and mercy, the word in Greek for that compassion is, you know, visceral, you know, feeling. The word is used many times of Jesus in the gospel when he goes out and sees the crowds and is moved with compassion. So that's what should happen to us in our gut. We should be moved with compassion and mercy. We receive it and we give it. Complete my joy by being of the same mind. All right, let's look at this a little more closely. By thinking the same thing is what it says. With the same love, yeah, that's what it says. United in heart, literally, it, Paul makes up this word in Greek. It literally means co-souled, S-O-U-L-E-D. It's like having one soul. One soul because there's one love and one Lord and one gift of oneself, which we share in Christ, which we live with and in Christ. And then there's thinking one thing again. Not thinking the same thing, but thinking one thing. All right, let's be clear about this. We're never going to think the same thing. It's not a goal. It's not, it's not an ideal. People are already going to have, all, always, and rightfully so, they're always going to have different opinions about different things. Theologically, you know, socially, spiritually, politically, we'll always have different, differing opinions based on our li own life experience, our own way of synthesizing the world, our own temperament, our own education, our own understanding, our own gift, our own uniqueness. So we'll have different ways of putting it together. So the thinking one thing is not having the same ideas and the same opinions about everything. Not going to happen, shouldn't happen. It's part of the richness of what we share to be able to share. Listen to one another, learn from one another, share with one another. So the thinking one thing, the one thing is self-emptying. That's the one thing. The one thing we should always have on our mind is how can I totally pour myself out? not cling to anything, not judge people by their worthiness or unworthiness by some stupid human standard. That's the one thing. So that's what we share. We share that emptying oneself to one another, to God, to the world, in Christ and with Christ. To confirm that, what continues, do nothing out of selfishness, literally rivalry, or vainglory, Hmm. People in the church and in business and in the Congress and the White House should listen to that. Nothing out of rivalry or vainglory. It gets, it gets worse. <laughs> Humbly regard others as more important, as superior to yourselves. <laughs> wow. <laughs> who does that? But if you're pouring yourself out, who can be inferior to you if you're empty? Each looking out not for his own interests, but for those of others. Wow. That's what we should be doing in the church and in Congress and everywhere else, in business, in our families, in our own lives. Not looking out for number one, but for everybody else. They're number one. Because emptiness. We're pouring ourselves out. That's what Jesus is doing, wants to do in us and through us. Many, many spiritual writers today are highlighting this kenosis, this emptying as the fundamental attitude of the Christian life because it's the fundamental attitude of Christ because it's the fundamental attitude of God from all eternity and for all eternity. And it's lots of fun, you know. It's like going on a roller coaster and being yourself. Wow! It's like going down a water slide. I mean, it'll cost you everything. But that's what happened to Jesus. It cost him everything. 
But it was worth it because he received a name above every name because love cannot be defeated, not can be, cannot be outdone. So the Father's love is victorious. So just keep that as your mantra. Empty myself. Empty myself. Empty myself. You won't go wrong with that. <laughs>